Myeloma Community Webinar Series. I'm joined by Dr. Juana Cunha, who is an expert in epidemiology. So, what is epidemiology? Okay, that's, uh, that's a great question because many, many persons uh, have not really uh, realized that epidemiology exists. Mm -hmm. And if they have heard about it, we have uh, weird definitions. Some people think it's epidermiology, like the study of the skin. Uh, and of course, that's a, a funny way of looking at a science that has been very important in uh, the late year uh, because of the COVID-19. And basically, epidemiology is the study of uh, the determinants for disease and health uh, what is associated to both disease and health status, what are the determinants, and how is the distribution of the characteristics of people, population. Uh, it can be applied to animals and right. all everything that distributes or can be measured uh, and, and its relationship to outcomes. So how a disease affects a certain population? It could be that, or how characteristics of certain populations affect disease. Oh, so interesting. It, it could go backwards. So it could go one way, which is we all have characteristics that determine that we could be diseased or remain healthy. So then again, is the determinants of healthy and disease status. Uh, or we could have some uh, diseases that determine that we end up in some having some special or specific characteristics such as a shorter lifespan or uh, a harder uh, living conditions and stuff like that. So, so, so epidemiology is a science that studies the relationships between some characteristics and health and disease status. Okay, so it's all about how a population and a disease interact together. Uh, more or less, yes. Okay. That's, that's, so that definitely that's, makes it a science yes. and not any kind of art. Well, you know, some people think that uh, and argue actually that epidemiology is not a science. And the reason why they argue that is because we are so used to sciences being based on hard data. And what is hard data? Like math. So it's pretty exact. Like yeah. physics. Factual. Pretty accurate. Well, factual, not, not really factual, but can be measured okay. extremely accurately. While epidemiology is, a lot of it is behavioral. So we have characteristics that can be measured quite accurately. For instance, your blood glucose or your temperature or your physical performance can be measured by other sciences like physics, like math, like chemistry. But there are many, many characteristics in epidemiology that can only be measured by, by uh, putting a set of inaccurate measurements all together, and those we call it behaviors. So how do you measure depression? It's a construct. So you cannot say, I am depressed uh, from zero to 10 and yeah. put it in an 8.65 four. <laughs> you cannot do that. However, you can say pretty safe that a person is depressed when a person is depressed or a person can say I am depressed and it's going to be sure that you're depressed, but how do you measure it? Okay. So we take many, many other markers or characteristics and we put them all together in what we call constructs and then we somehow quantify the the, the feeling of the status of depression. And we have many things like that in epidemiology. So in epidemiology, because we have what, what, what scientists call soft data, right. then some people think, oh, it's not accurate, so it's not a science, but it is a science. Okay, it does sound pretty complicated. Yeah, it is very complicated. It is very complicated because Sometimes we have to draw conclusions that are going to be important for people based on uh, certain characteristics that we cannot fully measure accurately. And things like that must have been so important through the past couple of years with COVID and how that well, spread. Well, you know, go figure. People realize that epidemiology is important when we got a pandemic <laughs> that 
seems not to want to go away and probably will never go away. So, so since the beginning when we saw the characteristics of virus, uh, many epidemiologists uh, brought to the attention of the world that this was not going to be a pandemic of come and go and that's right. it. It was going to be something to stay given those characteristics that we know that we can associate with, in this case, a virus that will remain with us for a very, very long time, probably forever. And an understanding of these things that you've mentioned, did that have anything to play with the public interventions that came about? I mean, I'm thinking about lockdown, for example, and ways of modifying human behaviour to prevent disease spread. Does that all link back to the epidemiology side of things? Yeah. So. So uh, here in the UAE, for instance, we, we have, I, I had the, the privilege and the honor of, of chairing the, the National Epidemiology Research Committee for more than a year. And uh, it, it, was, it was a set of outstanding scientists all together to try to determine what were those determinants of getting COVID, getting out of COVID, uh, being more or less acceptable, trying to predict when were we going to have one of those peaks so we could predict and adjust the health system so it would not be uh, overwhelmed. So that's how the Department of Health, for instance, or Dubai Health Authority, uh, were able to fine-tune interventions such as those that the people saw, which is Let's close the schools, let's open the schools, let's close the movie theaters, let's open the movie theaters, let's get everybody at home for a couple of months or a couple of weeks or uh, a period of time, and let's now bring them out. Those adjustments come from the epidemiological studies that define that the virus is coming, going, is determinants, what determines that we will have a peak or how can you project a peak, etc., etc. So, so yes, it's very important uh, to, to come up with, with epidemiology as the science behind the research that is going to define public health actions. And outside of a pandemic situation, I mean, I know it's impossible to think of life outside a pandemic situation right now, but how much does the study of epidemiology incorporate things like acute diseases and chronic diseases? Are there different approaches for either or? Yes. So, so epidemiology has been very, very important in the, in the study of the distribution of those characteristics that determine disease or health status, as I was saying. So. Uh, before, uh, the, the, the emphasis was made into, into trying to keep uh, deceased people in the lesser uh, status of disease, the, the, the less severe status of disease, so people would not progress into what leaves uh, longer term uh, disability, for instance, or worse consequences such as death dying, uh, but now we have emphasized in epidemiology as, as the brain of public health to provide information on what are the characteristics of populations that keep them healthier longer. Right. So now the focus is keep everybody healthier longer. So it's about what we call primary prevention. Okay. Let me give you uh, a rough example. Medical doctors are trained to cure disease. So basically, we need people to get sick in order to be our best. So as a medical doctor, and this was the old way of practicing medicine, you usually would be sitting in an office waiting for the door to open yeah. and somebody diseased to come through the door. Yeah. And then we can be our best. Well. Uh, in the last maybe 15 years, there has been a big flip in the management of disease, expanding everything into the field of primary prevention. So physicians are nowadays trained not only to cure disease, so the sequela or the consequences of the disease are the lesser possible, 
but also how to avoid that the next case comes along. So we're going from reactive to proactive. Exactly. So we are going from a, a treatment of those sick into preventing everybody that is healthy to get into an illness status. Um, we don't really know that through medical practices because then again, medical practices are about early identification of risk and management of those illness conditions. However, before that, epidemiology gives both medicine and public health the tools and the information that they need to implement preventive measurements, measures before people get, get ill. So in chronic conditions, it's very, very important. I mean, uh, one that, that we are very used to, but we were not used to that uh, before, is uh, smoking. So if you go to, uh, if, if you Google smoking in the 50s or the 60s, uh, smoking was actually good. Actually, many doctors fabricated, produced cigarettes, uh, saying that these cigarettes cure asthma. That's crazy. And cure bronchitis, and cure heart disease, and cure uh, headaches. And, and it was crazy. So, yeah. so there were Dr. X's cigarettes, and those were the <laughs> cigarettes to beat, you know? Uh, but through epidemiological research, we learn that actually the distribution of chronic pulmonary disease, the distribution of pulmonary cancer, the distribution of heart disease was actually worse, was greater on those people that smoke. And that's how we learned that smoking is actually dangerous for you. It's kind of a slow suicide because nobody makes you smoke. Yeah. You smoke on your own and you're killing yourself. So, so basically it is what we call a slow suicide. And that information comes from epidemiological research. So medical research, clinical research, is done, a lot of it, with epidemiological technologies, with epidemiological techniques. That's fascinating. So it means that it's, epidemiology isn't just looking at the disease itself, but it can be brought into so many other aspects of life as well. Well, misconceptions that are common are that epidemiology is only for public health. So even amongst uh, uh, professional uh, clinicians, and clinicians, I'm not talking about doctors, I'm talking about nurses, I'm talking about lab people, uh, uh, therapy people, etc. So everybody involved in the clinical world, in the management of patients with clinical conditions, they, they don't realize that, that a lot of the information, actually most of the information that they, that they know of how to proceed on a daily basis comes from research that has used epidemiological techniques to produce the knowledge that we have. So if you take the eight most important clinical journals, uh, four of them are general, meaning that they cover all bases. So is the New England Journal of Medicine, JAMA, uh, Lancet, uh, British Medical Journal, BMJ, and you take the most important of big specialties like pediatrics, uh, journal surgery, uh, internal medicine, American journals, OBGYN, and you study what do they publish, you will find that about 90% uh, of the studies that are published were done using epidemiological techniques. So epidemiology can be applied to public health and that was pretty much the always use of epidemiology, so it was to populations, but then it can be applied to clinical settings. So then we talk about clinical epidemiology, and clinical epidemiology has produced two big changes uh, relatively lately in the story of medicine since the 80s and 90s, which is the betterment of techniques to study clinical conditions in clinical settings. And second, it provides the fundamental tools for what we call evidence-based medicine, which is the way to practice medicine now. 
uh, it was not the way to practice medicine 30 or 35 years ago. So 30 or 35 years ago, a group of very important clinicians that were pioneers said, we need evidence to know what to do. We cannot just do things the way we know how to do them. We need to know that the things that we do are the best things to do. And that statement became, became the, the landmark of clinical practices now. But that sounds like it makes sense. Why was that not being done before? Well, go figure. <laughs> uh, that's why we say that the, that the least common of the senses is common sense. So some things, once you realize that they have to be that way, there are big ahas, like, wow, you know? But um, people were very focused, actually still, many people are very focused on just doing things right. And we're professionals. We do things right. At least we try our best. Now the question is, you do things right, but are you doing the right thing? And then are you doing that thing, which is the right thing to do right? So the focus changed dramatically in the practice of medicine, and now everybody is really talking about evidence-based practices, but that's relatively new. And that all stemmed from and epidemiology. Not exactly, and, and, and the tools to get there to know what is the right thing to do and what does making it right means uh, a lot of it, a lot of that information comes from epidemiology. But if it's so important and so prolific, how can it ever be trivialized? Well, uh, then we close the circle. Some people think that something that cannot be measured uh, completely accurately is not important. So there was a lot of purist scientists that, that were trying to define what was a science and what was an art. And when you go into medicine, medicine is everything but accurate. <laughs> okay. But exact. Mm -hmm. so, so we try our best, but we deal with human beings. We don't, we don't deal with temperature. We don't deal with, you know, mass. We, don't, we deal with all of those things and somebody that does whatever that person decides to do. So closing the circle, haven't we proven that and haven't we seen that with COVID-19? Today, the big deal is we have people that say, don't get the vaccine because it's gonna change your genes. And, 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 the, and you say, like, where, where, where did you come from? Yeah, where did you learn that? <laughs> and, and they say, well, it's an RNA-based vaccine, so it messes with your gene, DNA. Uh, no, it, it does not. It does not. We know that. Yeah. But they, they just keep going with those stories. So, so that makes the practice of medicine and, to some extent, the practice of public health and and, and inexact, inaccurate science because we deal with behaviors. So, uh, because of that, uh, some people try to minimize the importance of the information that we can get out of epidemiological studies. Because we measure things that are not uh, exact. We have measurement tools that are not exact. So when we ask somebody, um, do you smoke? That person says yes or no. Mm -hmm. So we distribute people into those smokers and those that do not smoke. And then we ask them, why do you smoke? How do you measure that? So then we have to put a scale. In a scale of zero to 10, how much is your, your desire to smoke? And, and then somebody will say, oh, mine is two. And then somebody else will say, well, mine is eight. And then you put smoking together with that, and you will find that those with a small desire smoke less, and those with a high desire smoke more. So there is an association, there is a relationship that is true. 
Is that exact? By no means. It's not exact. So then we have to take in epidemiology our cousin science, which is biostatistics. Okay. And that's why epidemiology and biostatistics overlap a lot and they go together so well. Because then it's not exact, so there has a width on the distribution of the data, and those data have that width by chance, it's random. And biostatistics is a science that takes care of measurement of randomness. Okay. So that's why people say, oh, the polls for the president say 20% uh, with 5% random variation. Right, okay. That is because we are trying to measure something that is not exact. It's a preference. And then we use epidemiology to design how to measure it and biostatistics to measure the chance. So you see, everybody uses epidemiology all day long, every day. You go to the supermarket and you pick a tomato I said, why didn't you pick that one? I said, well, because this seems to have a better chance of being better <laughs> for me and last longer. Yeah. Or I need the right one. You're just using epidemiological techniques to choose a tomato that fits your needs. That's more or less epidemiology. So we use it every day, all day long, but we just don't know it. I'm never going to go to the supermarket yeah. again without thinking about epidemiology. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so just, just, just to close with an idea, uh, I have been a clinician for for several decades, and and I I became I am an OBGYN, then I became a maternal fetal medicine expert and a geneticist, and um, after practicing clinical medicine. I went back and I studied epidemiology and I realized how much was I missing after I studied epidemiology to practice a good medicine. So that's why now every curriculum in the world has a larger and larger percentage of the curriculum dedicated to the teaching of epidemiological techniques so, so students can not only do research but also use research results better for, for the good of their patients. That's great. That's great. And obviously, that's going to save more lives. Absolutely. Now, it is, it is, it is so different that now uh, the knowledge about epidemiological techniques for research is considered a clinical competence, which means a clinician that knows exactly the same about clinical practices and medicine could be better by knowing epidemiological techniques. It allows them to first, with, same with the example of the tomato, it allows them to see and practice medicine, clinical medicine, in a way that you figure out that you are choosing characteristics and interventions and, and, and risk for the patient, but now it becomes completely evident. It's not just intuition, it's just evidence. And then, on the other hand, it allows them to also read research and evaluate which research published yeah. is biased or not biased, because skill. we have a problem with research that is published. Dr. Kwan, thank you so much for joining us and participating in this It's a pleasure. Anytime.